so I want to finish up our brief discussion of stereochemistry. So we spent the first lecture on stereochemistry reviewing some concepts about stereoisomers, enantiomers, diastereomers, differences between them. We looked at the next lecture and we spent, we focused on concepts in stereoselectivity. We started to name some, di some diastereomers. We learned syn and anti. We learned the concept that even an achiral material like an aldehyde can have a prochiral carbon in it, meaning that that carbon, when a nucleophile adds to it, becomes chiral. And we also learned the concept of there being two faces that we could name just like we name much like R and S. We learned that there was a ray face and a C face, basically a face that's sort of like R if you look at it and a face that's sort of like S if you look at it on that achiral object. So what I want to do today is to explore the manifestations of that idea of prochirality in some reactions. And we're going to do one. We're going to talk about the aldol reaction today. Aldol is a great reaction. It's one of my favorite reactions. If we have time at the end, I might talk about a related set of concepts in the esterenolate Claisen rearrangement. If we don't have time at the end, if we're going a little slower because I want everyone to really assimilate the aldol, that's okay too. I want us to get the basic concept. Now, the basic concept, and I wish my hands weren't chiral for this, but the basic concept that we're going to be exploring today is we're going to be putting together two achiral species, namely an enolate and an aldehyde. And there are four ways that they can come together. The ray face of one can come together with the ray face of the other. The C face of one can come together with the C face of the other. The C ray face of one can come together with the C face of the other, and vice versa, the C face of one with the ray face of the other. That is the big picture that we're going to get, that there are four ways for these prochiral objects, prochiral molecules to come together and bond. Those four ways are going to generate four possible stereoisomers. And what I want us to see and to be able to learn from this lecture is the idea of how we can translate the prochiral objects to a particular, the prochiral molecules, to a particular diastereomer. It's an advanced concept. It moves beyond sophomore level and it really gets us thinking about modern stereochemistry. All right, so last time I dropped a little bit of a hint. I said that we have enolates that are Z enolates, or sometimes they'll be called Z O enolates, and if we get to the second half on the Claisen, I'll show you the distinction. The Z enolate favors the synaldol product, And the E enolate favors the anti aldol product. So let me draw this out in a very concrete example, uh, or at least in uh, uh, not a very concrete example, but in a specific example of the aldol reaction. So let us take an enolate, and I'm going to work with lithium enolates. If you go on to a graduate level course, you'll see that there are many families of enolates, including boron enolates, silicon enolates, titanium enolates, 
Often nowadays, these more sophisticated enolates are used in modern aldol reactions. But it's fine for this level. We're going to keep it at LDA enolate, at lithium enolates generated with LDA, because you can get all the basic concepts you need. And I don't want to turn this into an advanced you know, uh, graduate level course. OK, so this is a Z enolate. That's, that's a lousy Z, so I'm going to rewrite it a little bit more neatly. Remember, Z is a fancy way of saying cis. It's a way of saying cis even when you have three substituents, three non-hydrogen substituents on a double bond. The oxygen here bearing the lithium is on the same side as the methyl group. Sometimes people will call this a ZO enolate because technically if you have an oxygen with a carbon on it, it's higher in priority and it gets a little confusing. But we'll just leave this as an R group right now. And we treat this with an aldehyde. So I've called my enolate R1, so I'll call my, aldele my aldehyde R2. And then, in a separate step, we add water. So, of course, we would have generated this enolate in an even earlier step with, say, LDA and the corresponding ketone, or if R1 is a, an OR group, then the corresponding ester. Then the product, we're going to get two main, uh, we're going to get one main diastereomer. We'll get the two enantiomers of it. And that diastereomer is going to be the syn diastereomer. And remember, syn is a fancy way of saying that the two substituents on the chain are on the same side. So here we had a methyl group, which I'm just writing as a wedge, as people often do at this level. The methyl group is on the same side as the hydroxy group. So this plus its enantiomer are the main products, the main diastereomer formed. And so for the enantiomer, I always like to just invert through the plane, so we're just going to invert through the plane to represent it. So I'll invert the OH group and invert the methyl group. And so this is the main diastereomer formed, I'll say collectively syn. Yeah? So uh, when you look at uh, like a syn or anti uh, in the beginning, like you see the syn or anti, do you look at just the oxygen and the methyl? You mean whether it's Z or E? Yeah, we look at the highest priority substituents. So Z and E in Kahn-Ingold Prelog notation, it's the same principles as um, R and S. You rank your substituents. So you rank your substituents. Carbon outranks hydrogen. Oxygen outranks a, presumably what would be a carbon. Oxygen with a lithium technically would be below oxygen with a carbon, but that's why I said in the case where you have an oxygen, sometimes people will call it ZO just to indicate it's been sort of artificially promoted. But yeah, so it becomes rank, rank, okay, this one ranks higher. Rank, rank, okay, this one ranks higher. They are on the same side, it's Z. So that's your basic Conningal prelog stereochemistry or your basic uh, stereochemical nomenclature for double bonds. Z, by the way, is, comes from the German zusammen. Zusammen is together on the same side. So I'm going to contrast this. Actually, any other questions? These are important, and this is important we discuss this now. Yeah? Uh, great question. So. When you're presenting things at a beginning level, often you don't present the exact numbers. So the answer is the, anti, the sin is favored. Depending on how bulky the R group is, 
that stereochemistry can either translate with a very high degree of fidelity, you know, 90 99%, or with not such a good degree of fidelity. The example that I'll give us, we're going to start, and you'll see this in a moment, I'll start with a tert butyl group here, which is very big, and it will translate almost with complete, or you know, as complete as you can measure fidelity. But if we drop, say, to an ethyl group here, the translation would be much lower. And this brings up a good concept. I've talked about the word stereoselective. Stereoselective is a statement of preference. Steric factors make a mechanism prefer something. The aldol reaction is an example of a stereoselective reaction, and we're going to see that one, that formation of the sin is good, formation of the anti in this example is bad, but it's not impossible. Now the Diels-Alder reaction, which you learned about in 51C and which we'll talk about in chapter, I think it's five on paracyclic reactions, is an example of a stereospecific reaction where the mechanism of the reaction dictates that two substituents that are on the same side of a double bond, say of a diene, must end up on the same side of the product. And so organic chemists make that distinction between stereospecific and stereoselective. The Diels-Alder reaction is stereospecific in that context. It is stereoselective. You probably remember the term endo? from the Diels-Alder reaction. It is stereoselective for endo. That is dictated as a preference, but not a hard and fast rule. And one of the funny things, and this is again teaching something at a beginning level, one of the funny things about the Diels-Alder reaction is the example that everybody invariably learns, uh, cyclopentadiene and maleic anhydride, is highly, highly, highly endo-stereoselective. Many examples of the Diels-Alder reaction are much less endo-selective, and in fact, you may even get the exo product predominating. And the example I'm going to give you today, here the Z-enolate has a relatively strong preference for the syn product, particularly when you have a bulky group. The next example that I'm about to write now, the E-enolate, has a um, slightly, slightly smaller preference for, um, for the anti. Um, so again, it's a simplification that's appropriate to the level. And one of the reasons why I mentioned people will use, say, a boron enolate uh, instead of a lithium enolate is because they are trying to get that control. And what we're going to see, the transition state um, which dictates, which helps preference this, uh, give the preference, is tighter, is better held together with other metals than lithium. But lithium is a fine point for this level in the course. Good question. I know that was a long answer, <laughs> probably more than you wanted to hear, but this is actually a lot of big concepts that I, I think are super important at this level. Other questions? Yeah. So does the lithium, um, does, it, does it react? Right? The so like you choose your specific, uh, like the specific like, um, substituent to the oxygen? Do you mean, do you choose the lithium? Yeah. Absolutely. And lithium enolates are sort of some of the easiest to generate in a controlled fashion. So this is what's called a directed aldol reaction. And there was this excellent question last time about, well, how do we know which one reacts and it's because we are taking control as an organic chemist. We're making that LDA, adding the first carbonyl compound, making it enolate, adding the second carbon, carbonyl compound, saying, OK, you're going to be the electrophile, because he's going to be the nucleophile, and then adding water in a third step to go ahead and quench the aldol product. All right, so let me come to the counterpart here, the E enolate. 
And so I'm going to draw the exact same structure with the exception now I flipped the stereochemistry on the double bond. So now the methyl group is opposite to the OLI group. And we're going to subject it to exactly the same reaction conditions. In one step, we're going to add the aldehyde. In another step, we're going to add water. And for that, we are going to favor the antiproduct. And so last time, I tried to get us in this habit of being able to permute among the various products. And so we're going to draw the antiproduct, so the two enantiomers, of course. All right, so our goal today is going to be to see how this occurs and to help think in three dimensions and to learn about transition states. So I want to take this to a specific example. It's the one that we're going to use here for today's discussion. As I said, it's one that there is a very strong degree of preference. So I'm going to take 2,2-dimethylbutanone. 2,2-dimethylpentanone, pardon me, and we're going to, in a first step, treat it with LDA in THF. That particular reaction gives us a 98 to 2 mixture of the Z and the E. I'm going to actually stop. I think I will stop drawing. I think in order that we can sort of function at a more grown-up level in our drawings, I'm going to skip the hydrogens in the drawing. So here's our Z and here's our E. And the Z to E ratio is 98 to 2. So that's our first step. I'm going to use as an aldehyde benzaldehyde. So next we will add phenyl benzaldehyde, then H3O plus. And remember, benzaldehyde is just a benzene ring attached to an aldehyde group. So we're going to, I'll just box this so your notes don't make it look like it's a product here. And so I'm going to draw out the stereoisomers. These are going to be the players in today's discussion. So we have a terc-butyl group off of the carbonyl. This is exactly the same stuff that I've drawn on the previous board, except now with a specific example of a specific reaction with a specific set of ratio of products formed. So we have our sin, and the translation of stereochemistry really is very, very good. We have 98% of the sin, and we have 2% of the anti. All right, so let's see how this reaction occurs.
So we can think of the aldol reaction as occurring in a concerted fashion. Concerted is a term that means that bonds are being made and broken at the same time. Kind of like the Diels-Alder reaction I just mentioned before. So I'm going to draw our enolate. And I'm specifically not going to worry about our stereochemistry right now in this drawing. We're going to worry about it intimately in a moment. So I'm just tucking the methyl and the hydrogen out of the way here. And so I want to draw our enolate and our aldehyde sort of near each other. And then I want to show you the process by which we make the bond. So we're forming a bond between the alpha carbon of the enolate and the carbonyl carbon. So we're going to form that bond by bringing electrons from the double bond over to the carbonyl. Concurrently, we can't have five pairs of electrons, 10 electrons around the carbonyl. Concurrently, we're going to move these electrons up. And if you want to be really strict about it, we can move them on to the lithium. I'm fine just moving them to this space over here. And we're going to bring these electrons down from the lithium oxygen bond into the other uh, oxygen, into the oxygen carbon bond. So when all is said and done, and we've pushed our arrows, what does that mean? That means that now, instead of having a double bond to the carbonyl, we have a single bond. Instead of having no bond to the lithium, we have a bond to the lithium. Instead of having a bond between the lithium and the oxygen that had been the enolate, now we have no bond over there. We brought our electrons down. We formed a carbonyl. Instead of having a double bond over on this carbon that had been the enolate, we're now going to have a single bond. And again, I'm not worrying about stereochemistry at this point. We're going to worry about that in a moment. And now we formed a new bond between the carbon of the enolate and the carbon of the aldehyde. And so remember, in the aldol reaction, the first thing we generate before we carry out our aqueous workup, before we add aqueous acid, is the aldolate. It is the lithium salt, and so this is our aldolate. And what I want us to think about now a little bit more intimately is what's happening over here. In other words, what's happening as bonds are making, being made, and being broken? As bonds are being made and being broken in this concerted fashion, all at the same time, we go through the transition state. The transition state is that high energy point on the pathway from reactants to products, that highest energy point. It's not a stable species. It is a fleeting arrangement of atoms and electrons fleeting on the order of femtoseconds as the bonds are being made and being broken. And so we can represent the flow of electrons, six electrons in a ring, much like the Diels-Alder reaction, much like the paracyclic reactions we're going to be discussing in Chapter 5, we can re represent those flowing electrons like so. 
Here's our lithium. Here's our oxygen. And I'll just draw again. I'm deliberately not worrying about the stereochemistry of the methyl and the hydrogen. Those are really ugly. I'm going to draw them a little more neatly. And we will worry about them in just a moment. So there is our transition state. Often people will represent a transition state in brackets. Often they will use a little double dagger to represent that it's a transition state. All right. So this sets the stage for us to see how the Z translates, the Z enolate translates into the synaldol product, and the E enolate translates into the antialdol product. And I've drawn the transition state here completely flat with no thinking about stereochemistry. And of course, molecules aren't flat. Tet carbons that are sp3 hybridized are tetrahedral, and we're on our way to having sp3 hybridized carbons, and your oxygen is sp3 hybridized, and your lithium is sp3 hybridized. So the concept that we're going to employ is called a Zimmerman-Traxler transition state. And it is basically a three-dimensional, whoops, Zimmerman, Traxler transition state. And the concept then is that the transition state is going to look a lot like a chair cyclohexane. So I want us all to be good, not only at drawing, and I'm not the best at drawing a cyclohexane ring, not only at drawing a cyclohexane, though more importantly, in conceptualizing in our mind what a chair cyclohexane looks like, which means go back, pull out your molecular models, and play with them, because if this is only a funny drawing on the page, you're not going to be in good shape to understand it. And as I said, my drawings are never as beautiful as I like them to be. But the big concept that we want in our mind is that we have hydrogens in axial positions in the cyclohexane. Three of them point up. Three of them point down. And we have hydrogens in the equatorial position. And if we're trying to draw well, our lines for the equatorial hydrogens are going to parallel the lines for the ring. And just like we have six axial hydrogens, we have six uh, equatorial hydrogens, like so. Thoughts? On to this archetype, we are going to impose this transition state. And we're going to see the implications of it. So I'm going to draw exactly the same structure, except I'm going to make it with dotted lines. Well, I'm going to draw exactly the same chair, and I'm going to make it with dotted lines, like so. That's not the best in the world, but it'll do. And those dotted lines are going to represent the bonds that are being made and being broken in the process. 
And for starters, so this is the basics. We're going to use this. And for starters, I'm going to put my lithium over here and oxygen over here. For starters, I'm going to make the back part my enolate. So here's my enolate. And I'm going to start with the Z enolate. So the Z enolate means that the methyl group is opposite to the terbutyl group, but on the same side as the oxygen. So there's our Z enolate. And then on the front of our cyclohexane ring, on the front of our transition state, I'm going to draw our aldehyde. And now we have a choice. Remember I mentioned faces when we started. We have a choice of two faces of the aldehyde. If I have it one way, the hydrogen's going to be up and the phenyl group is going to be pointing outward. In other words, the hydrogen is going to be in the axial position, and the phenyl group is going to be, my fingers here are the oxygen, the phenyl group is going to be in the equatorial position. If I point it the other way, and I can't quite do this with my hand, because my hand isn't perfectly trigonal and I need to stand on the chair, the hydrogen is going to be equatorial, the phenyl group is going to be axial. And axial is bad because it's going to bang into that terbutyl group. So we want the hydrogen axial. If I want to be fancy, I can put a little break to help things, help you see what's in front. So there is our Zimmerman-Traxler transition state. And I'm going to emphasize we put the phenyl group in the equatorial. And I'm going to complete the process of bond formation here. So when we're done, we formed our carbonyl group. Now our hydrogen is over here. Our methyl group is here. There's the alpha carbon. Our oxygen is, whoops, getting ahead of myself. Our oxygen is down here. Our lithium is over here. Our hydrogen is here. If I want to be a good person, I can put a little break in that line and back. And here's our phenyl group. I'll make my hydrogen just a little bigger so you can see it in the back. Thoughts or questions at this point? Does it translate to cyano groups or amines? Well, it can translate to enamines, I suppose, under the correct conditions. Probably not to, to amines. And cyano groups being linear, and again, we probably need to talk sort of outside the class on what your particular example is. But cyano groups being linear, probably not. But it does translate to a lot of sp3, sp2 type of transition states. And we probably won't have time at the end for the, um, for the clasin enolate, but that's exactly the same. The ester enolate clasin is exactly the same type of transition state. Another question in the No. Ah, so good question. Does it matter if the dashed lines are on the inside or the outside? No, I'm just trying to represent in the transition state 
we have partially broken the bond to the aldehyde, we have partially broken the double bond of the enolate, we have partially formed the carbonyl bond of the double bond of the carbonyl ketone, and we have partially broken and formed bonds to the lithium, and we have partially broken, uh, formed a bond between the carbons. Should you change the methyl to be equatorial or axial, or does that, does that Ah, another good question. Okay. Remember we had that LDA reaction that generated 98% of the Z enolate. So, once you have that enolate, and I'm drawing this in the same orientation without the rest of the transition state drawn in, once you have that enolate, you're stuck with that methyl. And no matter how I flip and manipulate, for the ZO enolate, for the Z enolate, I cannot put that methyl group equatorial. Good question. All the questions you should be thinking and asking at this point. Other questions? All right, last thing I need. I need you to come along with me on this. Can you see in your mind a plane defined by this phenyl? The carbon connected to the oxygen, the carbon connected to the methyl, and the carbonyl. Can you see this plane here? I'm going to trace it with my finger. See that plane? I'm putting my hand in it. Who sees that? All right. Take that plane. Take that plane. We're going to pick it up and do this. Now, on that plane, we have this oxygen pointing like this, and we have this methyl group pointing like this. Take it and pick it up. I'm going to draw a little bit lower. We take that plane, we pick it up. The phenyl group goes here. The tert-butyl group, that's a lousy tert-butyl group. The tert-butyl group goes here, so that's that plane. We have the carbonyl. That oxygen comes like this. It's pointing out. And the methyl group comes like this, pointing out. Who can see that? Take this plane, we have the oxygen, the methyl group, here's the phenyl group, I'm picking it up, the oxygen's coming out at us, the methyl group, I guess that was over here, is coming out at us. All right. What this has done, then, is we have taken ourselves from the Z enolate to the syn aldolate. Aldolate's just a fancy word of saying the aldol with the lithium on it, the lithium aldolate, before we've quenched with water, before we've quenched with acid. All right, imagine for a moment we have the same transition state. And by the way, for those of you who looked cryptically at me at the beginning of class and wondered what I was doing there, for reference, I have drawn this exact same transition state because we're going to refer to it twice once I will have erased this blackboard. Okay. So let us now see what gives rise to what would give rise to the anti. So I'm going to draw the exact same transition state with one difference. 
So we're going to get good at drawing cyclohexanes, and we're going to get good at drawing Zimmerman-Traxler transition states. We'll get a little faster each time. So here's our enolate half, the tert-butyl. Everything is the same. Here's the aldehyde half. It doesn't matter if we draw the line inside or outside. And that one difference I hinted at before, we're going to explore what happens if I put my phenyl group axial. Now, putting the phenyl group axial is bad. We get the phenyl group banging into the tert butyl group. They're both bulky. The tert butyl group has no choice but to be axial. The methyl group has no choice but to be axial. They're in the zigzag relationship. They don't sit equatorial as long as you have the z-enolate. But we have a choice of which face of the aldehyde to put. And now I've put the face with the phenyl group axial. And we're going to do the exact same operation. We're going to go ahead. <coughs> and I guess if I wanted, I could have gone and drawn a little arrow to show we go through our transition state. We're going to go through our transition state like so. And the one difference now is the phenyl group is up and the hydrogen is on the side. The phenyl group is still in what would have been the axial position. The hydrogen is still what would have been in the equatorial position. And you can think about this two ways. One way is to say, OK, everything's the same as this example here. As long as I was able to pick it up and bring it over like this, and we still have that methyl pointing out, now I've just flipped this stereocenter. So in other words, you can say, all right, we can go ahead. And we just recognize the fact that everything is the same, except the stereochemistry of the center bearing the the oxygen, or you could do it in two steps. You could pick it up and say, OK, now we have a plane defined by the hydrogen, the beta carbon, the alpha carbon, the carbonyl carbon. I'm going to pick it up and go ahead, and we'll have a hydrogen. Our oxygen now is pointing out. Our methyl group is pointing back. Our methyl group here is pointing out, like so. And I'll just draw that as just a methyl group, as just a wedge. And we have our ketone. And then, oops, I guess I have OLI. And then you can go ahead and just say, all right, now in my mind, I'm just going to rotate about, about this bond. Oops, that wasn't, what was that? That was our phenyl, not a methyl here. And that's going to be our phenyl over here. So in other words, the transition state to give the anti is bad when we start with the z-enolate.
Thoughts or questions? Thoughts or questions? Yeah. Uh, so you know how the transition state is your like energy. Uh huh. So how is that transition state formed if like if the anti is like like more energy gets in it or? The well, very little of it forms. Only only a teeny tiny amount forms, which is why the reaction is biased. If you learned about equilibrium Boltzmann distributions, you learned that at any temperature other than absolute zero, you have even unfavorable states populated. A molecule might at room temperature be 1.36 kilocalories per mole higher than another molecule, let's say a conformer, but you will have 10% of the less favorable conformer, or should say 9%, a less favorable amount of it. All right, I want to take us through two last concepts. The concept that we also get the mirror image transition state. And that's going to lead to the enantiomer. So now we're going to go back to forming the, um, the syn-aldol. We're going to just draw the mirror image of the transition state that I erased, namely the one that's on the blackboard. And the way I like to draw a mirror image is I just flip everything through the plane of the transition state. So we started with our enolate component on the back and our aldehyde component on the front. I'm going to put the aldehyde component on the back and the enolate component on the front. So here's our enolate component here, our lithium. And we're still dealing with the methyl group being uh, uh, Z to the oxygen. And now we have our phenyl group, still wants to be equatorial. Here's our aldehyde component. So this transition state is the mirror image of the one I just erased, the mirror image of the one on the board over there that I put for future reference, where we just flipped what's on the front to the back, what's on the back to the front. And we go and we take this on through. And now we go over here. And yep, I'm getting a little faster here because now I'm expecting you to be able to see things in your head a little bit faster. So now we go here. Again, we're going to define a plane. We're going to define a plane from the carb carbonyl to the alpha carbon to the beta carbon to the phenyl group. That plane is defined by my hand here. I'm going to pick it up. We've got the methyl group and the oxygen pointing off my hand. I'm going to pick it up, bring it on through. And now the oxygen of the aldolate and the methyl group of the aldolate are pointing back. And I guess if I'm, well, I think that's basically how I've drawn it. So we're going to pick it up, bring it on through, and this is the enantiomeric. And we form both enantiomers of the synaldolate in equal amounts. With 98% of the synaldolate, we form it in equal amounts. The final thing I want to show you, again a little bit quicker, is how we go ahead and get from the E enolate to the antiproduct.
And so we're going to do the exact same thing we did before. And we're going to go back to that very first Zimmerman-Traxler transition state. I drew and erased with everything the same. Here's our tert-butyl group. Here's our bond. Here's our benzaldehyde component. Here's our lithium component. But now, pay attention to the alpha carbon because now with the E enolate, I have a hydrogen in the axial-like position and a methyl group in the equatorial position. That transition state, and again, if I want to be fancy, I can erase my bonds and back to show you better the front and back. That transition state now has The methyl group over here in the equatorial-like uh, position in the product. Again, I'm going to do the hand trick. Hold my molecule, hold my hand in the plane defined by the phenyl group, the beta carbon, the alpha carbon, the carbonyl. Pick it on up, take it on through, phenyl carbonyl, tert-butyl. The oxygen was on the palm of my hand. That oxygen is still coming out. The methyl group is on the back of my hand. The methyl group is going back. And so we get the anti-aldolate. All right, this is a good point for us to wrap up stereochemistry. You've gotten to see one advanced level of a stereoselective reaction. If you go on and take a graduate level synthesis course, you will see many more. There is a brief reference to a stereoselective Claisen rearrangement in chapter uh, three you can read about an example where stereochemistry translates in the Claisen rearrangement. We will pick up on Monday talking about chapter four. We'll begin to talk about reaction mechanisms.